Hello, and welcome to a what if. And it's definitely an interesting what if because it's a what if which puts the world back as the British were strategically planning it to be in the 1920s and 30s. Yes, this is what if the French Navy had left France and carried on the fight in 1940. Now, here is the thing. The Royal Navy is not planning on the fall of France. In fact, if at any point you had turned around to a British minister or a British admiral and you had said, in a war which is going to happen at the end of this decade, or in the 1920s, at the end of the next decade, Norway is going to fall in weeks, France is going to fall in weeks, and we're going to be end up ending up fighting the entire thing on our own. Having to secure our eastern empire against the aggressive Japan, which we know is a problem. And which we're planning on right now. And also having to fight the Italians for control of the Mediterranean. Fight in North Africa against the Italians without the help of the French colonies which surround the Italian uh, uh, Italian colony, and therefore would have caused them a severe trouble there. And, uh, oh yeah, have to going to secure the Atlantic, where we're going to be bringing supplies, etc., resource across, from French Atlantic and Norwegian Atlantic bases, where German submarines are going to be running from, out from. They'd have looked to you and gone... I honestly don't know what strategic scenario they'd have come up with to try and fix that. Um, possibly invade Ireland. I, there, I, I'm not saying that as a facetious, entirely facetious response, because that would be some ready-made good farmland, which could get some food and some more people, and y you could have some more strategic depth to the British Isles. It's not a good solution, but it is also a traditional British solution of anything. If problems are going on, the continent's going badly, is to invade Ireland. I'm sorry, Ireland, I'm not encouraging it. Although, I think a few generations of my family were involved in it. There are some who marry Irish ladies. And some Irish gentlemen who marry our, marry our ladies as well. So, you know, hey are. But, leaving that all to one side... This is the scenario which the British were expecting. The British were expecting to fight any of the war in Europe with the French as their allies. Probably expecting to fight any war in the Far East with the French as allies. Probably the Dutch as well. They were not expecting to be in a scenario where the French were suddenly no longer fighting alongside them. And... You can see this, because in the British structures, where they're agreeing to, in treaties, etc., they are basically building a two-ocean fleet. Kind of like the Americans are building a two-ocean fleet. But if you think about it, the British traditionally maintain a home fleet, a Mediterranean fleet, and would need a Far Eastern fleet. Well, if you have the French as well then you have enough ships with a two-ocean fleet and the French and probably the Dutch on your side to have a Far Eastern fleet, have a strong enough presence in the Mediterranean to keep an eye in, on, the Medi on the Italians, and have a strong enough presence in the home waters to keep an eye on the Germans. And yes, there is always the lovely ruminated Plan Z, which, you know, the massive build-up of German ships... And before we get into the usual rant I have for people who want to go, yes, where was the British equivalent to Plan Z? Well, the British equivalent to Plan Z was, if anyone actually is building it, we have more infrastructure, we will build up to match and exceed it. So that's why the British don't have a big building construction plan. They are just building. They have ideas of what classes they want to build next, but they'll just churn them out as they need them. That's the advantage when you have the infrastructure in place. It's also, conversely, why I find Plan Z pretty silly, because the Germans are planning all this construction, and they aren't building the infrastructure for it. 
Even the infrastructure necessary to build that fleet, let alone maintain that fleet. That requires infrastructure. And I know, again, Britain is relying on most of its World War One era and even pre-World War One infrastructure to build it up. And the Americans are building brand new infrastructure. And people turn around and go, well, the Germans could rely on their World War One era and infrastructure. No, because actually the British were fairly efficient at making sure that part of the Treaty of Versailles was surprisingly well enforced. <clears throat> oh well, <sighs> just a small issue. And by the way, um, birthday party going on a couple of houses away, which I am invited to later. They know I'm recording, but they are, they're keeping the music up loud enough that I can hear, uh, hear it here, so I know what I'm missing. Sounds like it's going to be fun. Anyway, what if history disclaimer. I always put this up. Why do what if history? I know, I'm an academic historian. I get told by people that I am there for a serious, proper historian, because I have a PhD, and I teach in a university. So why would I do what if history? Well, firstly... It was proposed by a patron and voted for by more patrons. So it's obviously of interest, and that is the agreement I have, broadly speaking. If I think I can answer a question and it's useful, that the only criteria I will not put a question forward from patron suggestions to patron vote is if I cannot answer it in the time required. Some of them do go off to become specials that will be answered later because I think they're an interesting topic. It's an interesting question. I just can't do it in a month. I need more time to do the research and gather together the appropriate data and information. And the thing is, any question I put forward to be voted for by patrons, if it's successful, if it's a top two, it gets presented. Secondly, you can't go too far on these things, but it is possible to learn a lot about the consequences of actions, good, bad, or neither, from considering paths not taken. So, this is considering what the world would have been like if the British, the Anglo-French, uh, arguably, strategic assumption had held true. If, the Brit if France had not been taken out of the war. And I'm stopping at 1941, end of 1941, because... I really can't go further than that. I, do I think Japan necessarily enters the war in December 1941? We're going to work through two scenarios. I think under both circumstances, Japan actually entering the war in December 1941 is not a good position for them. They might well still be forced into it, because the timeline, remember, is not set by the Japanese necessarily themselves. It's set to an extent by the Americans' enforcement of various things. But it would certainly change the scenario for them. Thirdly, I do love a good historical debate and discussion. And what if ones can be pretty fun, as you need to learn the history thoroughly in order to be able to argue it well and considerably. You need to. You cannot, well, I, swear you can, I can't say you cannot. You can, of course, argue a what-if historical position from a position of ignorance. You certainly can. You can argue anything from a position of ignorance, should you so wish. But the realistic thing is you cannot argue it well from a position of ignorance. In fact, you can't argue anything well from a position of ignorance, apart from the case of proving that ignorance is not a virtue. Finally, this is all mostly my opinion, based upon my reading of primary, secondary, and a few tertiary sources, the understanding of the plans that existed at the time, and therefore no one else is to blame if you don't like it. Really, no. And NavalHistory.net and a few other places I have mined for images, and NavalHistory.net I have flying for a list of where the French fleet were, because, well, I was going through... Actually, a load of pink slips at one point in the UK National Archives, which did list where some of the French ships were. And then I was looking at some of the French documents I could get access to of where the French ships were. And they disagreed with each other. And I looked at another source, which was a secondary source, which I very nicely have a translation, courtesy of one of my best friends... 
Well, I know, but currently girlfriend, but I know what's coming. She doesn't watch the channel. We're fine. Um, so, yeah, girlfriend uh, ha has kindly done a bit of translation for it on me. And they all completely disagreed. So I looked at Naval History Net and went, hmm, that's broadly speaking in the middle of putting the fingers in the middle of where everything else is. So I'm just going to use you and blame you. The French Navy in 1940 is, strangely enough, considering there's a war happening in Europe, rather focused and orientated around being in Europe. They have a healthy force in the North Atlantic, in the Atlantic and the Channel region. They also have a very healthy force in the Mediterranean. This force, both of them, is quite successfully strong, capable forces. Are they massively, overwhelmingly strong, capable? No. But, on the balance of things, they provide Britain with a very strong ally. They are very useful ships. I know they include the burn. I'm going to try and not get too much into the burn. And I know that the French army has a lack in terms of communications, equipment, and all sorts of things, which really do hamper its capabilities to operate. But the French Navy is well equipped. The French Navy is, broadly speaking, well led. And I've been doing a whole series on their cruisers and their ships, and they're well designed. They do not have battle cruisers. Please note, they do have fast battleships. They don't have battle cruisers. Just because Dunkirks are babies doesn't mean they are battle cruisers. It's the same with Shan Horse and Eisenhower. You make a fast, lightly armed, because it's only got 11 or 13 and a half inch guns, battleship doesn't make it a battle cruiser. That just makes it the best battleship you could build on your own national industry. Which makes it kind of sad. And yes, there is one scenario under this circumstance that we're going to be talking about where I could see the Dunkirks if they had escaped getting rearmed with 14-inch guns. Because that would probably fit. Not too. It, it wouldn't be. Let's put it away. Too difficult to make the fourteen uh, to make the quad thirteen and a half inch into a quad fourteen inch. It would be not the easiest, but it would be but a po more possible than any other change if you had to standardize with British ammunition. And that's if you have to standardize with British ammunition. If you have access to um, the great big lump over here a bit north from that position, called America, with its factories, and Canada, with its factories, then you can more than likely manage to provide 13.5-inch ammunition for ships which, were, which are useful. They're playing my jam. It's terrible. Anyway. The other point you start to realise very quickly is that the French have... A lot of positions which are quite key in the South China Sea. They have Djibouti, they have Dakar, they have Martinique. They have all sorts of very useful places around the world which you really want on your side. Also, start thinking of this from this way. If the French Navy is on your side in, after 1940, the odds are you won't have to go and invade Madagascar and you won't have to expend resources doing Operation Torch. We'll talk into these things as we go through it, but there is a very real concept that has to be considered in wartime. You have the resources you have. I've said this many, many times. You fight the battles with what you have available. You fight the, you fight the war with what you have, not what you want to have. Well, if you have the French Navy on side as an ally, you have all those ships extra, and you have less jobs you have to go and do to cover, because you don't have to compensate for them. You lose the French Navy, you gain extra commitments, because if we look at this picture quite clearly, you'll notice that the Western Mediterranean is a French fleet zone. That's where there are many bases. 
That's where there are many ships. If you have control on the French fleet operating from that zone, you have the Western Mediterranean. The Japanese, uh, the Italians are stuck between the Brits in the east and the French in the west. Individually, they can go either way and might match up. But if they go one way, and even if they win, the odds are they lose enough ships that the other fleet comes from the other way and goes, Hello! You look to be beaten up. We hear congratulations are in order. Please enjoy the congratulations with our celebratory shellfire. So, this is what they have in the Atlantic ports. And it's worthwhile considering how much of a force this represents for the Atlantic. Total force available, two battleships, a, I'm calling it a CVE, an escort carrier, burn, because I think that's the best use she could be used for. I think if she had been used and available early in World War II, from about 19, for, June 1940 onwards through 1941 as a escort carrier, providing escort to critical convoys with a flock of swordfish aboard her, I know, technically we call them a squadron, but I always think of it more as a flock of swordfish. Leave that to one side, though. Um, then she would have been really, really useful. Three light cruisers. That's never hard to have. Um, four armored mer arm merchant cruisers. That's nice. We have some large destroyers, some standard destroyers, some torpedo boats. And a lot of submarines and four sloops. 29 submarines. Now, these ships are based between Cherbourg, Brest, Lorient, Saint Nazaire, La Palice, Casablanca, Dakar, Martinique, uh, Dundee, Scotland, that is, and Halifax. And yes, there are two more battleships listed here. There is the one under construction at Saint Nazaire, and the is, there is one under construction at Brest. The Riccolo and the jean -Bart. I've not included them in the numbers, but again, if you could manage to flit one out, that would be pretty darn useful when you're evacuating the fleet. Now, I would add, and this is a small thing, that even if you did flit one of these vessels out, the odds are you would have to take it to America to get it completed. In which case, you aren't going to be seeing it before the beginning of 1941. At best. But worked up, available, and more than likely, realistically, you're not going to be seeing it before the beginning of 1942. So, I'm not including those in the maths of whatever they could give the British. Or rather, work, provide as their contribution to the Allied war effort. <laughs> what do I have in the Mediterranean? Well, this is a rather more substantial force. This is five battleships, a seaplane carrier, eight heavy cruisers, six light cruisers, two armed merchant cruisers, 24 large destroyers, 18 normal destroyers, six torpedo boats, 45 submarines, and nine sloops. And please note, of those submarines, have a look at how many are based in Tunisia. Now, why am I talking about Tunisia? Well, we have in Bazette, we have three destroyers, three torpedo boats, and 16 submarines, two sloops, and an armed merchant cruiser. And in Suzy, we have another two Tunisia, we have another three submarines. So, 19 submarines, three destroyers, three torpedo boats. Why does that all matter? Well, let's think about this. If we go through the scenarios and talk quickly about Mediterranean, if you consider those ships in Tunisia, combined with Royal Navy submarines out operating out of Malta, makes the resupply of Libya even more difficult. So any scenario where the French Navy and consequently more likely French North Africa stay go free French does not do good things for Libya. You not only have far more ships blocking the potential resupply of their forces in Libya, 
you also have the likelihood that they have at best a mm, how do I put this actively unhappy with them uh, borders on three sides at worst they have a foot invasion from every single direction not good for the Italian army and the rest of the world well it is 1940 they have a light cruiser uh, Le Mour, Piquet. They have a sloop and an armored merchant cruiser sitting over in Saigon. They have an armored sloop in on the Indochina station, just wandering around. And they have an armored sloop in the Pacific station, plus some patrol boats wandering around. Always nice to have. Total force available that the French are providing. Therefore, well, if we consider it. They have seven battleships. They have an escort carrier. They have a seaplane carrier. They have eight heavy cruisers. They have ten light cruisers. They have a slew of armed merchant cruisers. Well, seven armed merchant cruisers. They have 29 large destroyers. They have 24 normal destroyers. They have 12 torpedo boats. They have... Oh, wouldn't you believe it? Oh, it's almost it's too almost too gorgeous to say. Seventy four submarines, and they have sixteen sloops and some gunboats. This is a significant force. Are all these ships Dunkirk's and Strasbourg's? No, they are not all the mo the sneakiest, modernist, most beautiful battleships you can imagine. However, are, is the whole Italian fleet made up of Littorios? No. Is the whole German fleet? Well, how many do they have? Four. Mm -hmm. And that's four eventually. At this point, they have two. One more coming and one more coming after that. So this is seven battleships that already are in existence. The loss of France fighting alongside Britain is the biggest single loss of Allied forces of the entire war. And think about it from another perspective. That fleet is sitting in the Western Mediterranean. That fleet is what Force H has to take the place of. So Britain goes from having this securing the Western Mediterranean to having to provide a force in the Western Mediterranean to cover for this. They go from having a asset to having a liability. They go from having a benefit to a cost. So yes, these ships are not all the best of the best they're all ships. They're all viable. They've all got crews. Now, I will say my overriding criteria for the two scenarios are that, rather like in history, the French Navy will go as one. If it decides to go, it will all go. If it doesn't and decides not to go, then very little will go. So my theory is that if they do decide to go and become free French which is the first scenario I'd be looking at. The French Navy evacuates with everything they can. Every trooper, every sailor, everyone they can get on their ships, they take away with them. This also means the odds are that the French Empire goes all free French. And it also means that whoever the most senior admiral who evacuates with them is, and this is debatable, because I know we all sort of talk about various options, but there are some older admirals who are sort of technically retired, but who could well have led such a thing as options, would probably become the leader of the Free French rather than de Gaulle. Now, apart from, at that point... Churchill being able to laugh at Roosevelt and going, ha ha, you've got MacArthur, I no longer have the Gaul. 
he wouldn't actually know who de Gaulle was, so that wouldn't actually register with him. It could have been interesting. It could have changed France as we know it to this day. But it's more importantly, in World War II terms, it would have changed the war massively. The Free French Navy. Everything goes. Now, what are their weaknesses? Their weaknesses are they don't have an aircraft carrier other than burn. They are they were sort of building talking about building some and they had designs. But Especially if this one, they lose France. They lose the industrial capacity of France. France itself goes Vichy France. You still have those Atlantic ports. You still have going for, uh, going to sort of the German control and German submarines being able to operate up from them. So all this is having to move to the UK. It's having to move to the Mediterranean. I wouldn't be surprised if the vast majority of the French Navy goes down to the Western Mediterranean. Now, I have a reason for this. The British don't really need them in the North Atlantic. They don't need them in the North Sea. Now, that's probably people going, hang on, but, you know, what about these far ships and all this? They're all useful, but having the entire French Navy in the Mediterranean secures the Western Mediterranean. And it secures that against the Italians completely, which means you don't have to do Force H commitments, which means Ark Royal, it doesn't have to be down doing Force H commitments. She can be off with the Mediterranean fleet um, and doing all sorts of things. You could even have Ark Royal, Illustrious and Eagle off with the Med fleet so they can have a free carriers supporting them, which I wouldn't put parts to the British. You don't have to have Hood doing it down with Force H. You can send her in for refit. You don't have to have Renown down there. You don't have to have Sheffield. You don't have to have all those destroyers and all those commitments which are down as part of Force H don't have to go. Oh, and poor Somerville doesn't have to get overworked to the nth degree either. You don't have to do Merzel Kabir. You don't have to do any of those things. And return, the French the French have northern africa which do consider important to france and it's part of france at least psychologically at this point will be completely their zone so they'll be able to establish themselves as a government in independent uh, freedom government etc they'll be able to focus their forces and they've got all their supplies they've got infrastructure down there they can build up more infrastructure and they can get supplies but it changes things dramatically. You still need to probably think about your convoys across the Atlantic. But now if you wanted to, you could convoy, send the ships down to a North African port and move supplies up that way. You also have, in terms of the fighting in North Africa, you can send the supplies to that North African coastal port, to Morocco, etc., and start sending supplies over ground. We'll talk about that in a bit. The important thing is that both will be able to actually orientate themselves around what they're most suited for. Both the French Navy will be able to focus on their capabilities and the Royal Navy on theirs. The French will be able to dominate the Western Mediterranean. By the French dominating the Western Mediterranean, it frees up the Royal Navy to worry about the North Atlantic and the Eastern Mediterranean and the Far East. And to an extent, they can both combine forces to put pre vessels present in the Far East. You suddenly have a lot more ability to do that. You also have a lot more ability to use all the battleships as escorts for convoy duties. You have a lot more uh, freedom of manoeuvre in terms of where are the destroyers, where are the blockading submarines coming from. The submarines that can be used to patrol the North Sea, patrol the Mediterranean, to block the movement of Axis forces. All these are going to be things which are going to be able to be done thanks to the capabilities which the French Navy will bring with them. So ultimately, what you're talking about delivering the British in this scenario is a powerful naval ally without land commitments in Europe. Okay, so basically 
all those people who want to continue fighting the Germans have left France in the Navy. The Navy's gone off and the Empire has basically been forced to go free French because the Navy are the significant force out in the wider Empire. Yes, there are army units, but if you have enough personnel turning up, wanting to fight, etc., they're going to be critical. The likelihood is you have de Gaulle also as part of this force, and he will probably end up in French North Africa commanding the ground forces. Going for glory! Attacking the Italians from North Africa. We'll get into that. Consequences for the Battle of Atlantic. Well... For starters, you don't have to supply those destroyers and all those convoys and other resources which you have to strain to go and supply the British forces in the Western Mediterranean. You don't have to maintain Force H. So if you don't have to maintain Force H, you can concentrate on the North Atlantic blocking force. Your fleet is now focused on two missions rather than three with a tertiary mission being the Far East and deterrence there. So you can focus more of your assets for decisive action without having to use your battle cruisers, Malaya in this case as well as Renown, for the operations, for Force H. You have those assets, those capital ship assets, for supporting operations in the home fleet area and dealing with German surface raiders should they come out. In simple terms, when Sharnos and Eisenhower go for a runaround, there are more assets in place to grab them or to hunt them down. There are more assets available because instead of you splitting your fleet three ways between home fleet, Force H, and the Mediterranean fleet, you're splitting it two ways. You probably still have most of the modern Queen Elizabeths end up in the Mediterranean. Because, honestly, pound for pound, the Italian fleet is more scary to the British than the Germans. Why? Because the Germans start World War II with Scharnhorst and Eisenau. You do not need a lot of capital units to deal with Scharnhorst and Eisenau. You just need enough and then to be fast enough and in the right place. This can be shown by the fact that HMS Renown, pictured here, took on them both solo, and they decided they would rather be anywhere else than facing her. Now, when Bismarck comes along, that's more problematic. But if Hood's been able to go in for a refit, which is likely under this scenario, uh, because she hasn't been needed for Force H, and because Renown's able to be back with the home fleet supporting them, then you have a refitted hood for, available for that operation. Is she as massive a refit as would have been done pre-war? Probably not. Has she probably had some of her armour rearranged? Maybe. Well, that's not the Golden BB. Who knows? But she will have had her engines reconditioned, she will have had her sensors upgraded, and so probably she's going to have the set, a similar radar fit, etc., as Prince of Wales does, which is going to make her gunfire more accurate. That's a problem. But also there's the fact that you could end up with an, a scenario where you have maybe Malaya, up there with King George V and Victorious. You might even have a second carrier up there in the operations. And you might well have a force of Prince of Wales, Hood and Renown. Now, that is a scenario which is not so good for Bismarck. Because even if she does do a Golden BB, there are still six 15-inch guns firing at her and whatever of Prince of Wales is actually working. There's also the fact that you don't quite have the same pressure on Prince of Wales to be out and to be operational because of the reality of the scenario, because you do not have that wider commitments. You can be more paced because you have just that less requirements. The Battle Atlantic, though, is still going to be pretty vicious. 
Again, submarines will probably have more of an impact. Remember, there are quite a few submarines available in the French force. And whilst I do predict the vast majority of the fleet in this scenario will end up in the Mediterranean of the French, I do think some of their submarines and possibly some of their heavy cruisers could well be supporting the British in the blockading force in the North Atlantic. I think that is a viable utility for them. So French heavy cruisers could be up there. I don't see their battleships, the Dunkirks, etc. being up there because they're being needed down in the Western Mediterranean. French battleships are good. They're not, well, they're good in terms of their crew. They are not the best of World War One era battleships. They are enough that in their group they can handle probably the Italians. Can they win? Mm, that's up to you to decide. The question is, will even in losing they inflict enough damage that the Italians do not want to fight them? Is it a completely different equation though? And that's what they're likely to do. Especially when you combine with cruisers and other assets they'll have available and aircraft from shore bases. Because remember, there are lots of shore bases for them in North Africa to support and provide them with air support. Most important thing they can do is with their submarines, operating from Tunisia and Algeria will make life a nightmare for the Italians in trying to convoy to Libya. We can add on to that. If you are convoying to Malta, well, suddenly you just hug the North African coast after outside of Gibraltar, and you've got air cover the whole way. You can dive into French ports. And then to get to Malta itself is you're charging across from Tunisia. But Malta itself could change in value very quickly. It could change in value incredibly quickly. Malta's principal value is that it sits astride the convoy routes to North Africa. If you do not have French North Africa becoming neutral slash pro-Axis forces by default because they can use it to go through to support Libya and support, the, uh, support their movements there, you have the worst case scenario for the Italians in trying to sustain Libya. It doesn't even need French ground forces in French North Africa to be attacking. They still have to secure their rear. They still have to deal with the potential of an attack from that angle. So that's going to constrict their forces more. You have the fact that submarines and destroyers and torpedo boats based in Tunisia can massively engage any convoys trying to come down from the west coast of Italy to Libya. And when I say massively, I mean overwhelmingly engage them. It suddenly becomes a funnel running through them, between them and Malta. You've got the fact that forces in Greece, etc., will be having an impact in terms of uh, trying to get out of the Adriatic. Libya doesn't last long in this scenario. Whether you have a de Gaulle-led attack into Libya, along with the various forces coming from the British, which were already pretty darn successful at the beginning of the war anyway, against Libya, and you have this combined force crush the Italians in between them, or whether it's just the British and the Italians getting some support, the odds are Italian North Africa folds very quickly. Long before Rommel can get out of there. Under this scenario, therefore, it changes the war in the Mediterranean because Malta is no longer important from the point of view of bisecting the convoys. It's suddenly a forward reconnaissance base, but, well, where are the Italian fleet going to? Where are their convoys going to? Italian Navy at this point then becomes a force which is stopping Allied convoys going through the Mediterranean. Well, they're just hug the coast of North Africa, and if the Italians do decide to go after them, there's going to be fleets waiting for them. Uh, what are they there for, then? Well, again, what happens at Taranto? If they are gathered in Taranto again for supporting operations in Albania and Greece, as they were originally, then, well, Taranto might well be done, carried out by a British fleet, which would have 
maybe all three carriers it could potentially have. It could have Illustrious, it could have Ark Royal, it could have Eagle with it. Now, I think probably at least one carrier is sent to support the French operations in West Mediterranean. I don't think they get Ark Royal because the British aren't going to give them their biggest and best. They're just not. It, you know, it, it just not what the French are going to get. And besides, they have their own land-based aircraft. So they might get Eagle. They might get Illustrious. But either way, you probably end up with Ark Royal in the Mediterranean fleet taking part in the Taranto operations. If she's supported by Eagle, she has the better worked-up crew of strike aircraft. That's Swordfish. But if she's supported by Illustrious... Mm, that's still a fairly good group, and that's still going to be a lot more aircraft involved in Toronto. Now, Gilio Chesare will still survive. I have told you before on this channel, there are many videos about Toronto. Gilio Chesare, whatever happens, is frigging impossible to try and get a torpedo lock on or get a decent bomb hit on in Toronto Harbour. Whoever placed her loves her and wants her to be protected. But the ships which are easiest to get lock on are the newest battleships. So you could have more damage done to Littoria, more to the Vittorio Veneto, and that is consequently going to have an impact on the Italian operations. No, Toronto doesn't wipe out the Italian Navy. It does provide six to eight months of leeway for the Royal Navy during the Mediterranean in terms of major Italian operations. They very quickly get a couple of battleships out to sea. Which is an amazing thing. And the fact that the Italians can put a, uh, could amass a force of six battleships together at the beginning of World War II is why I say they are far more scary for the British than the Germans at this point. But you do more, consequently more damage. You have the fact that Italians have lost North Africa. They are not able to really gather their forces and put a for uh, defend an empire there. The reason for the Navy suddenly becomes very defensive. Getting the funding for putting the, the battleships back together could be more difficult, especially with what could likely be happening in Albania at this point. Because again, Albania then becomes a focus. And if the Germans have to come in to help them, which they probably would do, considering who's in command of the Italian troops in Alba, fighting the Greeks in Albania, they are probably still going to sweep through Greece. Okay, yes, the British are going to have more, and the French forces are going to be able to deploy more, especially if they've actually won in Libya before the Germans have managed to invade, and Germans have turned up to help the Italians in Greece. This might lead to Crete not falling, because they might have more supplies there. But either way, it's going to be going there, and then where do you go from? You get Greece. Lovely. But... Are you going to fight your way across to the North Africa? And, uh, you know, are you going to do, do a massive Axis amphibious assault across the Mediterranean? Unlikely. You need a lot of shipping. You need a lot of capability to carry it out. I know they managed to pull off a surprise in Norway, but this is not Norway. This is not a government which is going, no, 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 we do not believe war is coming. We don't believe anyone's going to attack us. We don't believe this is going to happen. We don't believe this is going to happen. This is a scenario where you have the British and the French at war active, actively fighting you. And you have a lot of submarines there. So I don't think that happens. I think you no longer have the strain of the North African campaign on the Axis forces. But you also don't have the strain on the Allied forces. And the Mediterranean, instead of becoming a convoy battleground, becomes a sort of empty space. You might be considering launching a re-invasion of France from there to get to southern France, or you might be considering of, uh, launching an invasion of Sicily or Italy, but that's going to be something the Allies are going to be considering doing, not actively, well, building up forces for, maybe, but not really pushing for. I don't see them jumping into it and going, in 1941, we shall invade, uh, as we have now control of the Mediterranean, we shall invade Italy. Because they're going to want to build up their own resources for it. 
they're going to want to configure their own forces. There's also the problem, and this is something from the British perspective, but also from the French perspective. There's a lot of experience gained fighting in the North Africa campaign. There is a lot of military knowledge and capabilities developed fighting in North Africa that you won't have the opportunity to do. Okay? So it's both a benefit in terms of resources, it's a negative in terms of ouch. You also don't have the Syria campaign, you don't have all the Middle East campaigns, which distracts the British forces in the Far East, because they have to be deployed there. You have all sorts of divisions which are not have don't have to move from India. You don't have to do the Madagascar campaign. All these are big difference in terms of commitments, which lead us to the Far East. So what do I see happening? Well, it all depends on how well Toronto goes. If Taranto goes well and three Italian battleships are put beyond repair and you still have the French dominating the Western Mediterranean with their battleships, the British can probably switch around what they do with their battleships in that the Mediterranean fleet's heavy units can be the R-Class. Not brilliant but not that bad either. Slow, but enough firepower they can do the job. And therefore, you can build, put your major units in the Indian Ocean to protect them. They can deploy into the Mediterranean if you need them, but if you put them in Djibouti, if you put them in Ceylon, they can quickly move either way. They can go to the Far East or they can go to Mediterranean. And that would make sense. You would deploy things like your Queen Elizabeth class battleships, your Ark Royal, etc., to safety. So they'd be a long way away from Axis air attack. And remember, again, this is another problem for the British. All the lessons they'll learn fighting air defense operations in the Mediterranean, especially in the convoy battles, would not be available to be taught. Yes, the British still have that sort of methodology going in terms of air defense. But they don't have the learning experience, the critical learning experience of it. They probably still do get some of the critical learning experience, i.e. the evacuation of Greece. Probably it takes place. And the evacuation of Crete. I am not so sure whether Crete falls under this scenario. And the reason I say I'm not so sure whether Crete falls is because if you've had the larger force, as I've said before, take part in Toronto, you'll have had more damage done to the Italian fleet. If you are sure the Italian fleet is weaker, then you're going to focus more on defense against parachutists and air attack, possibly for Crete, which could well change the way to lay out. They might have also, how do I put this? If you don't have an ongoing campaign in North Africa, you probably have better commanders and better command structure because the, the command is not so divided in its focus. It's not focused on fighting Greece and fighting in North Africa and then dealing with the evacuation. It's not quite so overwhelmed. And if it's not quite so overwhelmed, Crete probably has a better command process in place and you don't need much better command for Crete to turn into a nightmare for the Axis. Which will again have an effect on things because you might decide to put a bomber force there, but also having a fighter force there and having things there, kind of like having fighters in Malta, etc., and able to supply them from the North African coast, means that you can do a lot of interdiction of enemy air attacks, and you can supply operations a lot easier. which means you can put more forces in the Far East. So I expect the Mediterranean would turn into a destroyer-focused war, and maybe cruisers as well. They would be taking the lead, but the newer battleships, the newer capital units, carriers, etc., would be in the Far East or in the, Med or in the, ho uh, in the home fleet. They'd have been in the ocean, able to rapidly deploy into the Mediterranean, but they wouldn't need to be in both. And that's what you would see, therefore. You would see a stronger force sitting in the Indian Ocean. Not in the far, far east, Singapore, so not a risk of provocative threat to the uh, Japanese. Close enough they can surge to Singapore and therefore become a problem. So they become a reassurance to the Australians. They become a reassurance to the Allies in those sort of regions. But they also... Me free up British land forces. 
to focus on the European campaign. You also don't need to move the Australian divisions as much around. You don't need to move the Indian divisions around as much. The forces that are in the Far East can concentrate on what they were doing in the Far East, which means you have more and... I don't want to say better forces, but instead of you having your A, B, and C team, and basically putting your best commanders in North Africa to do the fighting, your B commanders in Britain to do the defense of Britain and worry about the defense, and sort of C, in terms of broadly speaking, your next draw of people is, oh, we're sending them to the Far East. So it's the people, the C team by this point, I mean, are the people who are most tired, least well trained, least up to the, uh, most likely to buckle, are the ones that are deployed. To the Far East. Well, in this scenario, you have less strain, so you can deploy a better mix and less tired people to the Far East, etc. So you have a stronger presence out there. War in Europe would also be interesting. You'd still be fighting probably the Battle Atlantic, but it'd be very different. And with the Mediterranean secured, you can have a lot more resources focused on one or the other. And you have that gap you suddenly have a massive gap in terms of operational secure, a sort of operational need in terms of what you can focus on. Scenario two, France fights on. Now, in the live, I put forward the scenario that Hermann Goering, somehow, probably involving a rather large amount of butter, squeezed himself into a JU-87 Stuka so he can go and get some glory attacking France as part of the war, quickly, before the war is over, before it's concluded, and drops a bomb on the Eiffel Tower. Now, maybe this bomb manages to do a golden BB and knock the whole thing down. You never know. There's always an option. It's unlikely, but it's an option. Or it just plunges through the observation deck, killing a load of people, destroying the observation deck, and marring France's pride. Either way, France keeps on fighting. And at this point, they realise, hang on, the Germans are in the, at the end of their logistics, uh, logistics train. They can't do anymore. Remember how much, how many French lorries the Germans end up on depending upon to support, uh, support their logistics operating against the Soviet Union, operating in all sorts of other operations. They are using French lorries and getting French lorry production to support their army. Well, their logistics at the air, by the time they're in the race at the Atlantic, etc., is starting to fall apart. They make it, and it's shock and awe they've got there. It's an awe they've achieved it. So, their logistics picture, France fights on. Instead of it being a free French force, France the war becomes a war in the centre of France, and it's not quite like 1914-1918 because the French start mobilising, the British the second BEF is launched and they start to fight on and they that's the campaign going on. That's going to change things even more because instead of having the logistics issues that you would have had in terms of supplying the French fleet without French industry you have French industry still to supply them with their uh, with the necessary shells, etc. and things. You have the Italians fighting in southern, uh, trying to get across the border in southern France, as well as trying to go into Albania, and also fighting in Libya. Not a good scenario for them. And you have no longer got German control of the French Atlantic ports. So, that's going to change the whole spectrum of the Atlantic campaign. Because, yes, someone's already pointed out, we're going, oh, it's only a few miles further from the Norwegian ones to the, the Atlantic, to the American East Coast, and then it is from the French ones. Yes, it is only a few miles further. But the seas are a lot tougher. The seas are a lot tougher and a lot rougher. And that's going to have effect on your radius of action and how much support your milk cows need to give and what your ships are, your U boats, your boats are going to be able to achieve. So, suddenly, 
You no longer have access for the Germans to these dry docks, to these ports, for their big ships to come back to after they've been on their surface raiding missions. So they have to go back, out the, uh, back the way they came to get home to safety. They can get out into the North Atlantic and need to return the same way to get home to safety. That's not a good thing for them. That's going to seriously up the risk. Oh, well, no, it's going to make, make pretty much any such trip certain in, uh, to, how to, put it, to end in a certain way. Death. There is virtually no way they succeed in going home the same way they came out. Because the Royal Navy is very good at shutting the barn door after it's been opened. They also don't have to do, spend all these resources to build these U-boat pens, but the army is going to be fighting in France. And they're at the end of their logistics trail. And they haven't had the time to reorganize. And they haven't got the French lorries. And they are still fighting. And they're still engaging. And they're still fighting. And they're still engaging. And they're still fighting. And they're still engaging. This is not going to be good for them. This is going to cause a lot of trouble. Keep fighting in France is not good for the Germans. It's not good for the Italians. It's not good for the French, let's be honest. They're going to see their country once again devastated. And... Let's be honest, it's the psychological trauma of World War I which led to the decision-making process which led to the fall of France. The fall of France is not a military victory for the Germans. It's a psychological one. It's shock and awe attacking a group who have suffered, arguably of anyone in World War I, the most devastating losses on the Allied side and arguing the most devastating losses of any nation in the war, were suffered by the French. Entire generations are marred. Entire generations of leadership, of politicians, of military personnel are marred by what happens in France in 1914-1918 on the Western Front. It is devastating. However, under this scenario, they keep on fighting. And that is one thing you have to say about the French. In history, if they decide to keep on fighting, they are as stubborn and as unlikely to give in as anyone. In fact, more so than some. Which means none of those bases become... German. There is an interesting question. Does this lead to Rikulu and her sister getting completed on time? I'm not sure. I honestly don't know. They, but that'd be a significant commitment of resources, of personnel, which would otherwise be dry, uh, which otherwise be focusing on the new Western Front and the uh, battle line. But there again, the French might decide they need to complete them. If they do, that's a major addition to the Allies. But either way, this is also taking out the Bay of Biscay as a zone where, which is a critical importance to the British to fight through. Because, again, if you do not have those bases, if you do not have access through the channel you are going to be fighting mm -hmm. it that you're going to have to go further it's also going to change the convoy routing and this is going to sound strange but bear with me so supplies from america to britain because of these bases would go a more northerly route and come in western approaches to liverpool over ireland Without these bases, and the, considering the Germans operating from Norway, you would take them a southerly route. Now, to try and keep them as far away from the submarines as possible. And then probably bring them up through the Bay of Biscay to the western approaches as it was in World War I, but also delivering to France directly. 
So you could be getting supplies flowing directly to France, troops flowing directly to France. You don't. If you think about World War II, if the G Americans got involved, you wouldn't need to do Operation Torch, you wouldn't need to do D-Day, because you'd already be in France, and you'd already have North Africa. That changes the entire metric of the war effort. It changes the entire necessity of supplies and construction. You're no longer talking about building all those masses of landing craft. Because you don't need to. You can just take your Liberty ship or Victory ship or whatever you have to the port and offload. It changes the entire war. It also changes this war effort dramatically. Now, in the earlier scenario, Italy loses North Africa and only gains Greece, Albania with German assistance. Now, if the German army is still fighting in France, they're not going to be able to assist in Albania versus Greece. If you lose Libya and you lose in Albania, Greece, then there is a certainty of one thing. Il Duce, the fat boy, fun boy of World War II, Mussolini himself, the fascisti dictator, fascisti leader, who gives the name fascist to all those parties, because he achieved leadership first of all the fascists, will fall. It will be 1943, probably in 1941. Maybe earlier in 1941 than we would probably think it should be. Might even be end of 1940. Either way, Italy probably swaps sides. Either goes neutral or swaps sides. And that changes the Mediterranean from being a war zone to an allied lake. Hmm, that's useful for supplies, isn't it? But it also means you could suddenly have Germany facing invasion from across the Austrian border from Italian troops, trying to prove their loyalty now to the new regime. Ooh, trying to prove themselves the Allies and hope that they get Libya and all their territories returned to them. And the Greek army, well, they're now victorious. They have fought a very victorious campaign, could well be supporting the Italians. Could be a combined Greco-Italian assault on the south, south of France, uh, south of Austria. Austria, the French troops who were holding the border against the Italians would be able to freed up to go and fight against the Germans up north. This is not a good scenario for a European campaign if France keeps fighting, and Italy does as this. What do I think happens under those circumstances? Does Germany keep fighting? Well, they won in Norway which is the prize they have, but do they keep on fighting? Do they manage to keep on fighting? With their logistics falling apart, with all the issues they have, because we know one of the reasons that delays them, so, them in doing the, thing, uh, doing the things, the invasion of the Soviet Union, etc., is the time it takes to rebuild, reorientate their armed forces around that, after the operations they've done. They're not a paper tiger, but they don't exactly have the logistics for a long war. This is a reality of Germany. I can't tell you whether Germany would fall at this point. But I have this feeling that Germany, if it's got Italy now fighting, it finds itself fighting Italy, Greece, France and Britain, all sending troops. Yes, there's a major European mixer going on. Yes, there's a major war. Yes, it's draining all of them. The question is, what does the Soviet Union do? If they continue to occupy Poland, then they could find themselves as the bad people as well. But if they also turn, if Stalin decides Hitler's losing this, I'm going to take advantage of this to sort of bolster my position by, uh, by invading the rest of Poland, I think Hitler falls. I think Hitler gets taken out. 
It's a scenario. And the Far East, well, you no longer have any Mediterranean campaign going on. You have no need for a Mediterranean campaign. If the war, even if the war isn't over in by the by mid 1941 or a little bit longer, it's probably turned into a land war in Europe, and the German navy is probably bottled up mostly in the North Sea. Yes, they've got Norway to get them out, but there are enough resources now for that scenario that life is very, very difficult for them. What can we expect to see in the Far East? A lot of submarines. Because you don't really need submarines, well, many of them, in terms of Europe, uh, other than those watching the German fleet. You don't need them in the Mediterranean for operations there, because there's no need for them there. So all the submarines in the Mediterranean can go to the Far East. Uh, what else do you can you send to the Far East? Well, you probably want a couple of aircraft carriers for the home fleet, etc., to deal with the Germans, and some of the fast battleships, yes. But a lot of the force, Nelson, Rodney, Queen Elizabeth class battleships, Ark Royal, all those things, they're going out there from the British perspective, and you're probably getting forces from the French joining up. Again, it depends on which ships get completed, whether... Stra whether Dunkirk and Strasbourg stay as part of the fast force with King George V's and the battle cruisers to secure, well, to try uh, to secure the North Atlantic against German service ra large service raiders, or whether they get deployed as part of the forces to the Far East. Either way, you probably find. Singapore is full up of ships. And French Indochina probably, whilst might not have enough, a, a massive amount of land forces there, will probably have enough, as will India and Burma. And might even have British Indian troops sent across to assist uh, France in making sure it has enough troops in French Indochina. Which changes some things, because... In July 1940, why would the British close the Burma Road? Under Japanese pressure, the, the road to assist in national China is closed because Britain's fighting a war and it's it's suddenly losing France. It's losing It hasn't lost France. Why would they close the road? No, no, no. We're not closing it. We pretend we don't know about it. It's just about e commerce and economic support to going to nationalists. Uh, uh, it's just about commerce and trade. It's not. And there's no military assets there. What are you talking about? You really going to push when we have the size of fleet we can deploy out there, Floyd? Because, yeah, you might win, but how much will you lose and then fight that? And again, where is the fleet going to be based? Well, yeah, let's say it's based in Singapore. The Japanese would have to go all the way past French Indochina, past the Philippines, to get to Singapore. That's quite a long way. There's going to be a lot of submarines there, which might well spot them. So also, the Japanese don't get to go into, in September 1940, they go into and take a French Indochina. That's 1940. September 1940. They didn't launch their attack on Pearl Harbor till December 1941, after they built a whole lot of resources there to support their operations. They're not going to get that in September 1940, because the French are going to fight. So if Japan goes into French into China, it's going to start a war with the Allies. And this is the problem for another problem for Germany, because if Japan did that, Japan knows this, Britain will of course fight for the side of the French. The Americans cannot afford for the British to humble the Japanese, which is what the Americans would certainly perceive the British would do, because remember that Americans are pretty darn racist in some levels, but in their perspectives at this point when it comes to Japan, at least a large number of their leadership is, and they'll presume the British will win, in which case the British will secure the overwhelming powerful position in the Far East, as the British call it, uh, in near a in Asia, 
as the Americans would term it at this point. And we'll ultimately define the American position there. All for that. So this is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a scenario where it's very realistic that if the fr Japanese tried that in 1940, in September 1940, if they actually carried it through with the French going, no, there's a war. And the Americans join in, as well as the British. And so you have the Americans getting involved in, the, in World War II in September. 1940, because if they form up on side to defend the, their position in the Far East against the Japanese, they might not send troops to the European theatre, but the amount of supplies that are going to start turning up in the European theatre are going to be dramatically increased. That's a reality. If Germany's silly enough to declare war on them as well, then troops turn up. And again, you don't have to do D-Day. You don't have to do any of those major operations. You just put the troops in France and the war start, and they start taking part in the ground battle. Either way, the war is shortened dramatically. And the fact is, the only change in all this is the French Navy stays fighting for the Allies in both these scenarios. In the second scenario, you have the full French nation carry on fighting. It would not be easy. Please note, I am not saying that they are in an easy position. They've got a large chunk of their army cut off and surrendered because of the speed of the German advance. They've got the problems of their own radio communications, which they've shot themselves in the foot with. There are all sorts of problems in scenario two. But there's also the fact that the German logistics line is shot. They are moving on a wing and a prayer. And if the French political class had not been defeated mentally, mostly due to the experience of World War One, World War One, there could well have been a very different scenario. But even on the scenario one. There's no need for Operation Torch. Malta runs are very different. You know, it could be just an Abdiel class sitting in Tunisia going backwards and forwards with all the, with the equipment it needs. I, uh, the convoys take it to Tunisia and then Abdiel class and the various Fre uh, fast French cruisers taking alternates to move supplies to Malta. And the Far East has the potential to be very, very different because you have a larger force there. And the Japanese suddenly have to think that through. Let's say under scenario one, you have a, na a Royal Navy force based in the Indian Ocean. Okay. Attacking the Americans at Pearl Harbor or attack the British in the Indian Ocean. Those are your options. Which one do you start the war with? Well, to attack the Americans at Pearl Harbor, you can potentially get there without them telling you're coming. Because you go across through the Central Pacific and you avoid shipping lanes. You avoid positions where you'll see other people. If you were to try to attack the British in the ocean, how are you going to get there? You're going to have to go through a strait somewhere, and that runs the risk of spotting and being spotted by people. Uh, you have to go past very, very busy shipping lanes. Do you go round Australia? What's your route? And remember, those are all British, Dutch, French territories. It's not a good look, and it's not a good scenario for you. So the odds are you don't. You go after the Americans. And then you strain your forces, getting your navy ready. That's also going to change your response, though, if you think about it. If we consider ABDA command. Okay, that is in enough trouble, thanks to the loss of Force Z. But... If you haven't got French Indochina, your first invasion is going to have to be either French Indochina or the Philippines. Which one are you going to send your forces for? Either one you send for, the British fleet will roll to Singapore. That fleet will be carriers and capital ships. The Dutch forces, the French forces, all the other forces around there will form up around them. 
that will become a major force. That is not going to be a partial fleet operation. That's going to be a cruiser-led operation. That's going to be as many carriers and capital ships as you can get to go and fight that. That is going to be a Kante Kessen. It's going to be a decisive battle. Because that's what you're aiming for. Under that scenario, you're hoping to draw that fleet in so you can fight a decisive battle and win. And if you do win, great. But then you've got the American fleet coming across. And there's an even worse scenario for you because if that fleet's big enough, the American carriers might well be sent to form up with that allied effort because that's suddenly a major fleet. And you could be dealing with, I don't know, maybe a couple of illustrious class, an Ark Royal, and the three American carriers joining up. Yes, those six carriers do not have the same air groups necessary combination of as the Japanese, but that's a six carriers versus six carriers if you manage to amass the full Kido Batai. Two of them, at least, are armoured. Which means they're pretty tough to knock out. You've got some very interesting air defence doctrine going on there. You've got radar. That, that could lead to a very interesting battle. The whole thing is, losing the French fleet completely wipes out the British strategic planning for the war. And the French strategic planning for how to fight this sort of war scenario. It has been often said on this channel that the British do not really have a scenario in their mind for how to fight, and I've said this myself, how to fight their nightmare, which is a fighting war versus Japan, Italy, and Germany at the same time. They don't know how to fight it, but they always presume that even if they're in that scenario, they're going to have the French fighting alongside them, the French Navy, and that's important because the French Navy cancels out the Italian Navy, as far as the British are concerned. Yes, they have fours and against an either group in terms of advantages, but they pretty much cancel each other out. So that means the Royal Navy only has to take on the German and the Japanese, and that it can do. So when you take out the French, the other side suddenly gets the addition of the Italians, and you've got to take on all three. And that's when it gets complicated. Right, what have we got coming up? Um, ooh, what have we got next week? We've got... Birmingham's and Birkenhead, sort of town class cruisers from World War One. We've got Ian Carr's uh, escort carriers, ideas, designs, developments, and naval actions. And then in October, we have the Battle of Arusio, Lessons of an Ancient Land Battle. And also this week, the patron suggestions will be going live on Patreon. So if you're a patron, you can make suggestions, such as this topic. And then the week after that, patron vote will be live. And then, I will, of course, that will decide what's going to be 64 and 65. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much, and hope you've enjoyed. And I'm going to add, because I do try to make it as honest an understanding of what it's like to be an academic as possible on this channel. So, it's, life is fun, but at the moment life is going okay. I have the support of all of you, which is a massive advantage for me compared to many of my colleagues. I do tell them they should set up their own YouTube channels and these sort of things, but most of them don't seem to believe me that you're as supportive as you are. I don't know. I tell them to watch the comments and actually look at the uh, watch the lives, but you never know. Anyway, leaving that to one side. This week, believe it or not, I was supposed to receive some paychecks. I was sent emails on Monday confirming they would be coming through. Okay, happy times. Friday happens. They didn't arrive. Call them up. Oh, sorry, it'll be next week. We made an error. That's not unusual. In fact, I actually now factor that into my financial planning, that my paychecks will be late. And I know it's not just in the academic sector. I know it isn't. But 
because of the way academics are paid, especially contract lecturers like me, who are technically unemployed for two months of the year, so that the university doesn't have to, even though we actually do some work in those two months, but we'll leave that to one side. So the university doesn't have to do all sorts of things they'd have to do if we were um, uh, considered full year employees, all sorts of pieces of law come in place. That delay can be absolutely chronically damaging. It isn't chronically damaging to me now, thankfully, because I have Patreon, I have YouTube, I have, thanks to your support, I have those things. But it does delay things. There is a reason I haven't done a computers being ordered video, because that's been delayed. So the money which is assigned for a computer, in my case, and this is, I guess this is something commonly which happens with academics and with lots of people, I imagine, on low income, uh, who have, how do I put this? I wouldn't call myself low income, but I would call myself subjective income because the income sometimes is subject to vagrancies of life. You sort of go, right, instead of spending this money, which I've saved up for the thing, I'm going to keep it till the next paycheck comes in, and then I'll spend the money when I know I've got enough the next money for the money for the next month's next month's costs in. So you have to watch constantly. It's all about budgeting. It's all about money management, and this is something I do wish actually. I used to always give it instructions about it in when I was doing my welcome talk for PhD students. And explain, especially also to master students, explain to them how you structure your finances as an, as an academic when you're going into it, because it isn't taught enough. And I think it's good actually, m money planning, financial planning for most people. You save up money for something, before you spend that money, make sure you've got the money for the next couple of months coming. If the money is delayed, you hold on until it comes in. Because otherwise, you can be caught out and you can be functionally bankrupt. And the world is not kind for people who are functioning bankrupt. Bank managers become all sorts of very polite, but very unhappy with you. And it's not good. So there you go. Reality dose of academia. Tenure posts are great. If you get a tenured post and a, that's a full time contract, you are very happy in academia. You are overworked to the nth degree. I know I see my sister. I love her dearly, but she is overworked to the nth degree. She has to do all sorts of committees, all sorts of teaching. I think she puts on average a 90 hour week. I mean, there's not a day of the week she isn't working for her university. There's not a day. She doesn't receive phone calls. She doesn't have to do, deal with student issues. Uh, this is on top of doing her research, which she has to do. Otherwise, they won't promote her. And doesn't and the department's ranking will suffer if she doesn't do the research. This is on top of her teaching load. This is on top of her mentoring load. She also has to deal with endless other things. And yes, that's normal in a career, but I'm not quite sure if academia realizes it's normal in its career because they seem to forget they need a life outside of work. And in academia, because it's so vocational, and I know there are lots of other industries which are like to now consider themselves vocational, but academia has always considered itself a vocation, a calling, as much as a career. There is almost less of an understanding of, oh, you have something you want to do outside of it. So that's the uh, that's the payoff for tenure. But if you don't have tenure, if you don't have that full time permanent post, then you have the other trouble in that. The university almost, universities almost seem to expect you to act like you have that full-time post whilst paying you a fraction. You know, I. it's not something I'm unused to doing is having to negotiate with universities over back pay. And when I say back pay, I mean, oh, we have miscalculated your pay or this, that, and the other. And you go, okay. I know that. I've told you about this. It's now been a few months. What am I going to get? And that causes fun with the tax man. It's brilliant. You know, I've, now I've said this before is thank you to all of you. I know I do these things uh, quite occasionally. You probably sometimes some of you are probably sick of hearing them. But the point is, I every time when it happens, I do it because 
I love naval history. I love being the academic. I love teaching students. I love doing all that stuff. It's a lot of fun and it's a very fulfilling career. But I think it's behoven on anyone who does this sort of public facing side to be honest about the problems as well as the benefits, which means when I have the problems, I tell you about them and I also tell you about the benefits. So you, so anyone who's watching me and who's thinking about doing it themselves has as accurate a picture as I can give them of what the reality of modern academia is. To quote one friend who I was talking to recently, academia is getting very good at eating its young at the moment. And they're going to be fine for the next decade. But in two to three decades time, they're going to have real trouble. They're going to have real trouble. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support. As said, I couldn't be doing any of this without you. And thank you. And soon I hope to have the new computer bought all the components and then I will build it and I will do a video of me building it for you all. And uh, then hopefully it will solve all the problems. Take care.